Fakatakati hau ki te uru, fakatakati hau ki te tonga, ki a maa ki na ki na ki e tai, ki a maa tora tari ki tai. E hi ake ana te atā ki rahi e teo, hi huka, hi hau, hi tihei mauri ora. Tēnā koutou i ngā iwi, kua hui mai nei i tēnei ata, ki te kōrero i ngā kaupapa whakahirehira. Nau mai ki tō mātou webinar, he mihi mahana ki a koutou katoa. I am Moira Clooney, I am project lead for te ngākau kahukura, and so pleased to welcome you back into our virtual space today for the second in our Takatapui and Rainbow webinar series for the youth sector. Welcome back to those of you who joined last Friday for our kōrero with Dr Elizabeth Kirikire and Siobhan Kahutumai around working with Takatapui young people. Um, today we have another excellent couple of speakers who are going to speak to the kaupapa of respecting bodily autonomy and supporting self-determination for our, our intersex and trans whānau. But um, just before we introduce the speakers this morning, ooh, technical difficulties, sorry. Um, I wanted to just say a little bit about Tingaka Kahukura and what we're about. Um, Tingaka Kahukura is a national initiative that sits in partnership between rainbow communities and Arataohi, which is the national peak body for the youth sector. And our vision is really for Takatapui and Rainbow young people to be safe, valued, feel like they belong in all the places where they live and learn and access healthcare and social support. We are a small team, we don't provide frontline services for young people, we work at more of a systems change level. So we work with people and organisations who influence the systems around young people in Aotearoa. So people like funders, political decision makers, researchers, training providers, sector bodies, government agencies and youth services and all of you joining us today um, to help people understand rainbow populations and issues and think about what they can do within their own work, within their own sphere of influence, within their own mahi. So we were privileged to work with Dr Elizabeth Kirikiri to find our name, Te Ngako Kahukura, and she also gave us a whakatauki that speaks to our work, which is up on the screen now. Um, kia puawe, me puawe, which is really um, in order for our rainbow young people to grow and flourish and thrive, um, we also must grow, we must do the work. Um, a lot of our work with Tingaka Kahukura is educating and coaching and training and helping people who work with young people to um, understand what it really means to respect and manaki the rainbow young people who they work with and who they serve. We also work quite closely with the rainbow support sector with organisations like the Intersex Trust and Gender Minorities Aotearoa and Outline and Rainbow Youth and others to work out how we can connect them up with the resources that they need to grow the support they provide. We've put together this free webinar series for anyone who works with rainbow young people in Aotearoa to learn more about um, what that looks like. And we really want to get into it. We want to move past the sort of 101 to go a bit deeper. Um, we might not cover off all the questions that you have today. Um, we encourage you to check out our website, to read more, um, and please do get in touch if you want to ask us anything else. For today, if you have a question for our speakers, please put it in the Q&A section. That's the easiest way for us to, to see it and to make sure um, we respond. And you're also welcome to use the chat section if you want to introduce yourself or um, talk to each other or um, add any reflections or comments. Just make sure that you have it set to all panellists and attendees <coughs> so that others can see it as well. We've also got Jen Shields from Qtopia with us today, um, keeping an eye on the chat. Jen's helped us put this webinar series together. So let's get into it. Um, and introduce our speakers for today. So really privileged to have two amazing people with us today to share their whakaro and experiences. Jelly O'Shea is an intersex person who's the current communications and project manager for the Intersex Trust Aotearoa. Jelly is a community worker who thrives on collaboration and creative responses to communi communication strategies that empower marginalized people. Jelly spends their days demanding that everyone should have the right of bodily autonomy in the evenings making jewellery at their studio hideout. And Joey McDonald is a non-binary trans queer Pakeha living in West Auckland, working for Tingaka Kahukura as the training lead. 
They're particularly interested in wrangling health professionals and empowering community workers to improve health and social services for people who are trans, queer, intersex, pakatapui, rainbow, all of those wonderful things. They want to see recognition of self-determination in the form of high quality informed consent healthcare and recognition of the strong relationship skill, relational skills that rainbow intersex, takatapui, queer, trans people and organizations led by those people have developed in the face of intergenerational systemic injustice. So I'll hand over to these two to have a bit of a chat and then I'll pop back on later to um, ask any of the questions that you have. And just a reminder, if you have questions as people are talking, um, pop those in the Q&A so that we can, we can see them. Um, but just to start off with, um, I'll hand over to Joey and Jelly um, to ask, what do we mean when we talk about bodily autonomy for, um, for intersex and trans people? Uh, mm -hmm. Joey, do you want to start with that? <laughs> Thanks, Moira. Kia ora koutou. Uh, I also wanted to note that I'm not sure if it was just on my version of the uh, webinar at the beginning or if it was for everyone, but there was a little slide up that was advertising the next webinar, um, which is with John Oselu. And I'm not sure that we had our title slide up, but maybe we did. I'm still figuring out how webinars work. But just in case it's helpful, the, the title kind of subject matter starting point for me and Jelly to talk today was something like bodily autonomy, intersex and trans conversations. So that's that's what you've showed up to listen to today. And we're quite good at improvising. So we're planning to just riff off each other and we have some key themes to get through. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that we have advertised different webinars at different times. And at one point, this session was advertised as having more of a thread of disability stuff in it. And that's extremely relevant to the conversation that we're having today. But it's also something that we thought we needed to make a bit more space for rather than weaving it into an existing conversation just with Jelly and myself. Um, so that will probably uh, be part of our conversation, but we're anticipating a later webinar that we can talk more about another time where there will be a really centered focus on disability advocacy and rights and how that relates to this kind of queer, trans, rainbow, takatapui, intersex stuff. So I just wanted to put that out there for, there'll be some people who are following the webinar series that are being really diligent about watching all the different things. And we really appreciate that. And also if people have just popped on to, to watch this one, I wanted you to situate yourself to know what you had just started attending. Yeah, cool. So Jelly, do you want to add anything about what, how you're hoping this conversation will go or set things up for our listeners and watchers, how our bodily conversations and our thoughtful reflections might be? Um, yeah, I think we were just talking before uh, about the intersection of like lived experience and then when you work in a role where um, your, your expertise is somewhat based in that lived experience. And then the intersections of being in an amazing conversation like this and sort of where you sit and where your organizational responsibilities sit. So I just wanted to say, yeah, we're definitely just gonna be having an organic, spontaneous chat and response. And so, yeah, like holding that this is like me as mm. my little experience. And then also I have a role with a intersex led organization that's really important to me and I'm passionate about. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like we're both trying to balance, um, as probably anyone is who's working in this space, but trying to balance all the time between our um, our own take, our own personal stuff that we're bringing in, um, and our connections to particular people and particular co-papa and whatever, and then we're also bringing some amount of um, organizational perspective as well so Jelly and I wanted to be able to have a like medium spicy conversation today where it wasn't wasn't like we're going to be only speaking as our organizations we are speaking as ourselves as well um, but noting that we are working in this field so um, 
I wanted to say that I've heard you, Jelly, in uh, in other meetings, mention things that uh, sparked this thought for myself about a kind of Venn diagram of uh, trans experiences loosely and intersex experiences loosely and how that overlaps and also is distinct. And you've talked about, uh, say for example, I think um, when we were talking about trans young people in one meeting and saying, I was saying something like, you know, you need to use the name that the young person wants you to use and respect that they are the authority on themselves and don't be just listening to the older relative to determine how you should be engaging with that young person if you're a social worker or an OT or a nurse or whatever you need to be listening to that young person and especially in the field of like health that's a particular it's hard for uh I'm using trans in a very broad way but it's hard for trans people to assert themselves and get listened to right and you were like yes that's really a true and relevant thing for intersex people but from a different angle because you were talking about health information often being withheld, right? So do you wanna, does that spark anything for you about this question of bodily autonomy and the kind of contrast between trans experiences of when that is respected and when it isn't and intersex experiences of when bodily autonomy is or isn't being respected? Mm, yeah, thank you. Yeah, because I think, um, the core of what we're talking about might be that bodily autonomy could look like um, a, like what they say, what they call as patient-centered approach. So like mm -hmm. the, the individual who's accessing the gender affirming care or the um, like health needs of their body mm -hmm. um, should be the primary voice in that space. Mm -hmm. um, but what we find um, with intersex communities is that um, because some of the, like lots of the interventions that happen to their bodies are often at a very young age um, and even, you know, right through teenagehood, um, there is more of a parent-centered, mm. like caregiver focus there. Um, and that's just standard practice. That's, mm. you know, not something that's really been largely investigated or critiqued um, and, you know, for lots of people who work in a clinical space, you you could present them with the idea of centering the patient and they'd be like, uh, they're six months old. They <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. the parents know what they need, you know? Yeah. So um, yeah, there, there's that dynamic that I think could be a really interesting like juxtaposition, but obviously really nicely um, relates to the same languaging around trans, healthcare and affirming mm -hmm. stuff is like of course if the patient is saying this is the sort of um affirming healthcare that I would love access to sounds like they kind of know what they need and want um mm. and again that's like a patient-centered model mm. yeah. and it made me think about like that there's a common thread that a lot of people, not just intersex and trans people but certainly if we're talking from a focused place of being intersex and or being trans acknowledging that definitely some people are in that middle space and would identify as both there's a really harsh thing that we're all coming up against which is that medical authority like if you're thinking of bodily autonomy and self-determination and who gets to say what is or isn't an acceptable body and what is or isn't an acceptable um way of being in the world with that body like there's some very clear opportunities for solidarity and work together to try and challenge what the medical institution has set up as um, the correct standards and the way that all bodies should be and I think one of the things that I hope that trans people maybe are getting better at or at least I'm seeing some conversations about is not going with an assimilationist agenda all the time not going in being like um a, you know a trans person needs to assimilate to or um sort of try and embody the cis normative or um white supremacist version or 
colonial settler state health system version of what an ideal body is and what um, what we should or shouldn't look like or be. And I would hope that that's something that intersex and trans people, if we're all doing that to some extent, pushing back on the expectation that we won't look trans, that we don't want to look trans, or we won't look intersex, or we will, you know, there's there's something that our bodies are devalued, that our ways of being are not seen as valid in themselves. They're seen as something that is on the way to something else or something that needs to be corrected or something that we want to do differently and trying to like un untangle some of that is I think happening at the moment, but untangling who's told you that that's the way a body should be and is that how you want your body to be because that's cool if it is like that's everyone's perspective is going to be different on that I don't have a view on that how it should be for everyone but I also feel like we are strongly encouraged to do it certain ways or to be certain ways is there anything from your perspective that you would like to see trans people doing or that in that space of showing up for each other and pushing against the medical stuff when it's unhelpful anything there yeah that's like a, a rich layer of fungi really isn't it <laughs> um yeah well the things that came up for me when you were speaking then was actually um a conversation that i was having um with morgan carpenter um who's an intersex academic um mm -hmm actually probably would love if I said lots of those fancy titles in front of their name because they have them but yeah. um he's written a lot about um that sort of that um correlation between ableism and um heterosexuality mm. and where the medical um establishment combines the two of like what what um what function looks like what's a what a bodily function looks like and how that is how that performs and mm. that really I think um is something that you know when the languaging of like transition itself is like what you said you're on a journey from one place to another um and essentially the medicalization of all bodies and and this is where it does um intersect with the disability space is that idea of like what a functional body looks like yeah the motivations motivators um, in society that are telling us what a functional body is, is a sexualized one. Mm. So, um, you know, the performance of that is obviously like um, whether you are able to perform sex with a, a person of the opposite sex. Yeah, yeah, in a very yeah. heterosexual way. Absolutely. And then, and then the ableist stuff is like how you, how you perform as like in your sex so like can you pee standing up if you're a mask can you pee mm. sitting down if you're femme you know those sorts of things mm. are like massive centers of um surgical intervention um which you know when you think about like the health and well-being and the bodily autonomy of someone is that a health issue mm. yes okay if it is then then like let's hold that in that space but if it's someone actually being like you know, when I look at my well-being um, and my happiness in the world and who I am as a person, I think I can negotiate some of those things myself. Um, yeah. And so I think that actually there's a real similar um, platform that trans communities and intersex communities are sitting on and that history like goes back mm. for a long time of what first um, informed um, the way that the medical establishment looked at intervening with trans and intersex bodies and they weren't necessarily always what the community was asking for it was yeah. a, a placement on their bodies of like okay well this is how you do it and this is how we're going to do it um and obviously there's a massive power dynamics in that and to have any sort of like reflection by such a monolithic industry that you could be made valid mm. Um, that societal pressure to want to be valid is in all of us so yeah erase this part of my body so I can fit in mm. or conform my body so I can look like what I'm meant to look like um and in that yeah you lose all that sense of celebration because you know what you're talking about on that journey is yeah what does that middle place look like and mm. and 
those of us that are leaving that place, it means there's not more representation for just like this heteronormative folks out there to mm. like actually just get used to our awesomeness. Mm, mm, mm. And like something about what do we think is possible and what do we think is um, viable? And I love that there's more what I, I feel like something that I'm seeing with, I would say young people broadly, um, but also even people my age, late thirties and, and that that's, it's seeing us de defining ourselves or um, deciding what's possible in relation to each other, in relation to trans and intersex and queer people and the ways that we live and the ways that we do things and the bodies that we have, at, rather than against a different external ideal or norm or that idea of function like yeah mm, that's trying really to interesting. shift it so that you know I feel like if you have if we have robust peer groups and the internet has been very helpful for that it doesn't solve a lot of material resource deprivation problems but it means there are places that people can have a peer group even if they don't have ability to get around and go into town or, or visit people in the area and that seems to me to be really helpful for being able to stand with each other and say yeah sure like peeing sitting down or peeing standing up like as long as you can pee and you feel good about that like surely that's not a defining thing right like that's doesn't have to mean something more than whatever you say it means like, and if we can say that to each other, then there's more chance that we can negotiate and push back on um, some sometimes very benevolently well-being, well-meaning, but sort of benevolently heterosexist or, you know, normalizing kind mm. of healthcare provision or mm -hmm. people who think we must want a different ideal or yeah mm. and yeah that brought up to me the idea of like when we're dissected into these sort of micro groups all the time and then we're all like sort of individually trying to push up against the system and being like hey can we be let in the room are our voices are valid oh no wait once again I didn't feel heard mm. um we we don't have the same energy or ability to to connect and come together and um and also there's always those like microaggressions as well that happen that can mean that there's like am I there and you know there's 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 sadness and pain and and because you've got a bunch of people who are just like um maybe stuck in a place which mm. means that you know we can be really sensitive and um bang into each other a little bit more so mm. yeah, I, I think it's something that you see in lots of like minority communities is that you end up sort of being more separate to each other. Um and, and like to each other. Yeah, yeah. And um and I think actually combining together where those intersections are and like pushing against mm. those systems in that way is like super powerful. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It yeah it is there's a lot of skills that a lot of people working in this kind of what sometimes gets called the rainbow sector as if that's a coherent thing but you know like working in advocacy about health and justice broadly for trans and queer and intersex and takatapui people a lot of us have a lot of skills at trying to balance all of those different things to try and understand where the intersections are um but I would love it if more mainstream organizations or agencies uh, understood better the pressure that any one of us would be under if there was only one of us in the room. Like, you know, I think you've been in that position, I've been in that position where you're like really carrying too much of the pressure to say all the intersex things or say all the trans and queer things or say whatever it is that you're supposedly representing um and it would be great if 
people recognize the importance of it's not just diversity and inclusion and adding a few more into the room, but actually having people be able to be in relation to each other, like being able to have multiple intersex people in a room relating to each other and relating to the content and being able to have multiple trans people in the room relating to each other and relating to the content when you're doing any kind of consultation or any kind of process that's meant to be community inclusive, like makes it possible for there to be actual range and different perspectives and nuances and then everybody gets more out of that even though it might make the process slower because you haven't just got that one token person who's signing things off um yeah, yeah. there's something ironic in there that only just came to me where um the more time i spend doing the consultation work the less time i actually spend with community so if i'm meant to be the representative i'm actually um I'm usually too tired to like hang out with my peers because um, I've been in like a six hour hooey. Um, yeah, and drink too much coffee, you know. Um, and, and like, obviously, like, it's really amazing to be able to be brought into those spaces. But often yeah. our organizations, the only time we see each other are, are situated um, in those places where, yeah, we've all got like three minutes each to speak. Yeah. Um, on behalf of all of our communities in a shared space about one very particular focus. Um, mm. And so it's like, yeah, something that I would love to see made space for is um, actually just space, like that, that pl places could hold like peer support groups, you know, in a, in a safe facilitated way, but like, um, how do we know what um, bodily autonomy um, is? Because unless unless people are actually getting to like work that out for themselves and then like talk about it mm. I mean I know for me that's how I process things mm. how I learn. um and I think especially for people who are only just um getting their heads around what's going on for them and how that can fit in the world that's actually just like something that can't ever be yeah undervalued it's yeah. just it's so special and um and not something that we are often funded to do or it's prioritized mm. as like a thing I think um we often get like really project focused mm. um and those soft spaces of togetherness are actually just like so key to that like getting that healing um mm. and acceptance which maybe we don't get in other parts of our lives mm -mm -mm. yeah yeah there's so many relationships to be trying to tend to and they and it we really need spaces that are uh, like, look at you and me being excited to have a webinar where we get a chance to talk to each other about some stuff. And like I, at the beginning, Jelly and I were like, oh, this is great. We hardly ever get to chat to each other. And then we were both like, this is cool. We're just going to make it up. But also I guess it is being recorded and probably there's some people watching. It's not really like a, it's not a chat. That's like a casual hangout. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but it almost feels like this is filling some of that need, even though it is also an educational experience, hopefully for other people. And it's making a resource, you know, but it's also trying to have some, yeah, trying to have some conversations with each other that are just focused on each other and focused mm -hmm. on what we want to say and not orienting ourselves all the time to what does that particular agency or service or what does the, the bigger institution want us to say or do or what do we have to push back against now? You know, it's like if I, I want to be oriented towards queer and trans and intersex and takatapui people, I want that's like, I'm pretty lucky. That's a lot of what my life is. And that's where I think I want to live. You know, that's, that feels pretty, strong and also I know that's not where a lot of people get to live so yeah that, that's that's something that I, I I wish there was more of I wish there was more possibility for because mm. I guess that's the point maybe of like how we got here um is that um maybe having moments of experiencing um that utopia of being absolutely surrounded by your peers and like being able to affect the space around you so that it feels safe 
mm. um, or a less reflective and like challenging and, and all those sort of things, but in a, in a way that um, is so rare to experience. And so, um, you know, behind all the, the sometimes complicated layers of doing advocacy is that um, that's the point and it can be that simple is like, well, if we get to um, break down all these systems of oppression and everyone gets to, um, you know, really feel themselves. Yeah. Um, then, then yeah, those soft spaces can happen. Um, so it just means, yeah, there's kind of like, we've got to strap on our armor sometimes, mm. I guess, and mm. like, not always in our advocacy, get to do that soft space. We're doing mm. that more like frontline stuff with mm. the interest of being able to get back there. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah yeah um and the and the peer the peer conversations are so much where you get to figure out what the shared ground is and what what you would protect you know like what would you keep for that space and you wouldn't necessarily bring it into a government consultation or you wouldn't necessarily bring it into a training with the mainstream youth service like but if you don't get to work that out until you're doing the training with the mainstream youth service, it's, it's, it's much harder. That's a bigger ask. And like, I was thinking of, um, there's a quote like the, it's about imagination and the importance of imagination. And it made me think of you and some of the conversations I've had with you, which is from Ursula Le Guin, who like who I really love it's speculative fiction. Yeah. Um, in a book called The Wave in the Minder or The Wave in the something like that. I can't remember, I wrote it down somewhere. I wrote the quote and it says, we will not know our own injustice if we cannot imagine justice. We will not be free if we do not imagine freedom. We cannot demand that anyone try to attain justice and freedom who has not had a chance to imagine them, imagine them as attainable it's like, I really feel like that's relevant to us challenging that medical pathologization of intersex and trans bodies. Like, mm -hmm. I want to work out what's possible and attainable and know about what the injustices are that you are facing and that I am facing and figure out how we address that together, determining the possibilities with each other, not determining the possibilities against that dominant you know, settler state health system mm. that's not serving anyone hugely well, even the staff who work in them. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, then you just, I feel that sense when I go into hospitals of like this big giant mechanical organ that's like massively constipated and <laughs> has rusting, you know, like yeah. pipes and stuff and just all these people in there being like, oh shit, trying yeah. to hold it together. Put you some know, tape over that. Having some having a stink time. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I love that um that idea of like I know it's a a, a thing that um that's in Black Lives Matter activism of like that you've got to bring the sci-fi in, you've got to imagine another world. Cause like yeah. you can't just be out there like fighting on the front line all the time when there's these like again like monolithic oppressive structures that have been in place for so long. Mm. um so you've got to like be like whoa what would a totally different world look like and like how do we get there mm. um that that's the same like here with um Matiki Mai and um like constitutional reform mm. you know actually being like screw the Westminster system yeah we're going to create our own like Māori constitution and that's just that's going to benefit everyone if you're into this kaupapa mm -hmm. you know and so like looking at those different um pathways um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it was really exciting yeah and Thanks looking for at bringing up that quote I'm all like yeah, yeah. <laughs> justice injustice yeah I like I, I feel like it is a link like speculative fiction that this is not the topic for today but it is relevant to bodily autonomy it is one of the ways that I have tried to figure out what what does my bodily autonomy mean for me and how does that go in the world like that's genuinely one of the places where that imagination is possible um I feel like it speaks to the the non-linear nature of time and what so like 
if you're try people think that sci-fi and speculative fiction is about the future, it's about imagining a thing that hasn't yet existed. But like here in these islands in the Pacific, we actually have a way that has been imagined and was happening here before colonization and Christian missionaries and that whole process. Like, so while I know we can't, I'm not saying turn back time and just forget that settler colonization happened, but there is a way of doing things that is already here. So it's it's a it's a circle of time. It's not like, oh, what could we possibly imagine that's far away and in the future from somewhere else? It's like, no, there's ways of doing it from here that are better for here and for anyone who is here, you know, mm -hmm. like, hmm. but I know it's 1137 and we do have the, <laughs> I have to like rein in some of my topics. Oh, I've got so many more things to say, but yes. <laughs> Right, we can just catch up afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Kilda, I might jump back in and um, put across some of the questions. Mostly there's um, just been kind of love and support for a lot of what you're talking about, um, particularly around peer support and around the need for like more spaces, for more of those soft spaces for our community and for people working on the front lines or in activism to work this through. So people are really loving it. Um, <laughs> But I guess one of the questions um, that's just come through from Annie is, um, just, I struggle to understand the diverse challenges of those who have felt different, whatever that may look like, and attempting to provide services for rangatahi of difference, does that add to that feeling of not being the norm? And um, I think, yeah, just add to that, sort of reflecting back on some of what Jelly was saying, how, do, how can people who are working with individual young people um, kind of celebrate awesomeness <laughs> or celebrate um, or support self-determination for trans and intersex people. Who has thoughts about that? <laughs> um, I will just say simply, I guess, I, especially for young people, there's a lot going on for them, right? And like, um, sure, like their variations in sex characteristics or their intersex parts of themselves or their like gender um might really be impacting like how they sit in the world but I think it's also really important for um people working alongside them to not always think of that as coming from the negative like mm -hmm. um and obviously if that's that's not being supported and celebrated around them then if we do absolutely internalize that as negative it's so something that like you know I still have to fight against every day even though I'm here being like I'm awesome even um, yeah <laughs> yeah so I guess that um I'm kind of like how can you reflect that world that they could be part of where like those parts of themselves are just one part um and their love of like gaming or um native birds or whatever is also really important and you know and getting that full sense of self to really be celebrated um, mm. that's just one thing that came up for me Joey Hmm. Um, I, I, I am looking at the question and trying to figure out what, um, and what exactly my answer would be. And I don't entirely know. Uh, there was just a comment too, which I might, um, yeah. read out, which is like reflecting back on Jelly's Corridor, so taking a strength based view, kind of like sure. transness or intersexness is part of their fabulousness, but it might not necessarily be the defining factor. Mm. I guess I'm hoping that we can go beyond what I think strength based is a good starting point, similar to saying that diversity is a, is a good thing, is a good starting point. Um, and I what something I'm trying to work out is how do we move beyond just saying, okay, here's the existing system and how can we include more people in it? How can we recognize that, oh, look, there's diversity in this system. I, I turned it upside down and shook it and a whole bunch of different kinds of people fell out. Like that's, that's good because it's actually going further than a lot of places do go currently people 
I don't, this is not making, it's not even totally clear in my mind, but I want to try and move towards uh, talking about power and justice, talking about why is it like that? And what could you do to like, whoop, set it up totally differently. So it's not just adding more and being inclusive with the system as it currently stands. How do you do advocacy and support that tries to change the understandings that are underlying how things are? Like mm -hmm. that's talking about informed consent healthcare is a good kind of phrasing, I think, for trying to talk about why things should be centered on what a person needs and wants and how it should be delivered flexibly based on what that person is up to and what they need at this time. That's a different approach to just being like, oh, we want to make the existing healthcare services um, more friendly to trans and intersex people, which is also a good goal. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm here for that because sometimes that's what needs to happen first. But it is like I want to, I want to reach further than it. Does that? that yeah, I mean, something, like, something there. I got, I got it. Feeling yeah. It. Totally. Totally. And I guess the other question um, that's just up in our Q&A from Rion is zooming out to that bigger question of um, justice <laughs> overall. Um, with the changes to healthcare that are being signalled and discussed at the moment, what are the main avenues of influence we can pursue to encourage the changes we are hoping to see? I guess I'd add to that, how can we, how do we work together to make sure that those changes are covering all of our diverse needs? Wow, what a segue, that's classy. Um, I would say that injustice is just 100% not acceptable. So if everyone could just get on board with that, and be like, <laughs> hey, um, yeah, there's massive DHB overhaul. Um, how much confidence I have in like um, the system actually changing and how much it will just like have a pretty edifice. Facade. Facade, yeah, um, is something that I think there's concerns are, but I do think, um, and my colleague Mani Mitchell was often talking about this, like, is this an opportunity? Can we get in there and start actually like building some of the systems that aren't there? Um, but yeah, I, and then also to bridge what Joey's just talking about of like, what are those, what are those like wider societal influences that we all can like actually like break down and challenge and say, yeah, why are, why are people's bodily bodies being erased so that they look the same as the norm? Like, mm. it's wacky that we have mm. systems that are actually doing this. So mm. I just think if we had mass momentum of people saying, of course, everyone deserves patient-centered healthcare, you know, and what that looks like for trans and intersex communities is really not that complex mm. so um we yeah we really need like that i think kind of like wider momentum mm. which means some internal kind of challenging your own sponged um yeah like those norms that that get us all and like the wider momentum avenues of influence and was in that question as a good phrase, like probably depending on where you're working, that will be different, de like whether this is something paid work or unpaid work, whatever, I don't mean your official job necessarily, but like where your, what your sphere of influence is will be different depending on where you're positioned. So while I don't feel like I could say everyone should do this or everyone should sign on to that statement or do this thing, because it probably depends where you are situated as to what changes you could contribute to most effectively, there will be um, there will be things that happen that if you're paying attention, that ITANs will probably do some things in relation to these these healthcare processes. So keep in touch with ITANs, look at their website, follow their stuff, or keep in touch with Tingako Kahukura. We make government submissions and lobby things. Like keep in touch with the community groups that you know about in your area. And I don't mean keep in touch, like ring them up and tell them, you need to tell me what's going on. Don't give them more work, just follow what they're up to. 
and like look for an opportunity. I think there will be like, you know, there's PATHA, the Professional Association for Transgender Health, Aotearoa. Hopefully we can do some advocacy and uh, sort of policy advice work, or I don't know what that might look like exactly, but there'll be, there will be organizations who are um, often just voluntary organizations, but like some with paid staff who are, who are working in this space trying to make changes. So if you're trying to figure out who you can connect up with and what those avenues are, those organizations are a good place to look and at least think about. And I, there's, a, there's a list of them on Tengaku Kahukura's website. There's that information will certainly be available and we'll put some resources up on the webinar like website page as well. So mm. maybe that's. Yeah, absolutely. And um, maybe to kind of reflect on this too, because I guess some of the work that I'm involved in is, um, is some of that national level advocacy, particularly around trans health, but also supporting um, some of the work that ITENS does. Um, I mean, I really feel like the changes to healthcare are a real opportunity to make sure that we have good access to healthcare nationally that's based on informed consent models and supporting bodily autonomy and self-determination and all of those good things. And I think, um, you know, there are channels through, like we have a minister who has responsibility for, associate minister of health who has responsibility for Rainbow Health, who's looking at both of those issues. So there's real opportunities to kind of explore what that looks like in an intersectional way. Um, I guess what I've been kind of ranting about to various people recently is just that I think what's really needed um, to make sure that happens though is leadership, is um, people really prioritising that um, and um, looking at what's needed on a national level. So the parallel that I keep thinking about is um, when Auckland shifted to the super city, um, the library system here did a really amazing job of kind of looking at um, all of the different library systems across the city and deciding like what are the best policies from a customer perspective um, and how can we just implement those across the board. So like Monaco libraries didn't have any fines for children so they were like sweet let's not have any fines for children across the whole city or one of the libraries had a policy where you could like reserve a book and it would be delivered to your closest local library and suddenly we had that across the whole the whole network and um, that was a decision that was made and that was some real strong leadership that meant that we've now got a really world-class library system, I reckon. Um, mm. Whereas in comparison, there's a bunch of other departments where each of the five different councils had their own one and it took them just years and years, um, decades to kind of come up with a standard system and like a consistent culture across the city. And I think we're in that position with um, trans and intersex health. Um, with these changes to a more centralised system is like we could decide to prioritise it nationally. Um, there could be some real work put into this and we could look at like what's working well in pockets of the country or with particular like amazing healthcare professionals and amplify that across the country. Um, or we could end up in a situation where um, we're just sort of averaging out the not so good practice across the whole country. So I'm really seeing it as an opportunity and hoping that um, we can influence some of those national leaders to really prioritise it and put resource into it. I'm not exactly sure what the answer is to making sure that that happens, but um, mm. we're on the case. And I think Joey's suggestion around keeping in touch with ITENS and with PATHA and with Tangaka Kahukura and um, the organisations working in the space is a really good one. So um, that's my two cents on that question. Um, okay just uh, kind of on the policy tip as well, we had a question come through from Jesse, which is around um, being mindful of wanting to put minimal pressure on especially intersex groups and advocates to provide really basic advice that people should find out about for themselves by reading up on what advocacy groups are putting out, but at the same time not wanting to assume that they know as someone who's not intersex, the right policies and ideas to implement for intersex people. Um, so question was around any suggestions about what points people should be engaging with intersex advocates when developing or implementing policies or changes or service design um, or other things that will implement will, will impact on intersex people. Any mm. thoughts? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks, Jesse. Um, I think, yeah, acknowledging that there is a really small amount of intersex people doing this particular type of mahi um, is important, but I, I do think that if there is a point where you're developing policies um, 
like specifically for any group yeah building a relationship and having conversations um when possible and I think if if there is a bit of wait time because you know say for example we're like hey we're so overloaded at the moment um like just be patient and maybe just wait um until there is a good time um but specific examples there's like the classic um which is the Darlington Statement. And so that's like um, a bit of a hefty document, but um, if you're really getting into like writing policy, it had some policy brains like really formatting it. And so that's a, um, a like basically a commitment that you can make as an ally or as an intersex person. Um, and there's a dedicated website for that. If you just look up the Darlington Statement, um, I'll just use, updating something in the question I think but yeah just to say that you know if that's oh cool yeah Jesse's on it but just yeah for the wider audience like that's a great um a great way to like formulate maybe some of the languaging around that but at the same time I do want to acknowledge that our communities um while it's got some really strong um reflective practices um you know that we are still uh, what I'd say is like kind of emergent and so the languaging um, is something to always check in with and make sure that that's still kind of the way that um, we're, we're identifying and, and sort of the terms, you know, at the start, we're sort of, we're saying like, um, wanting to ban all unnecessary medical practices that um, are not life preserving. Um, and then, you know, we had doctors come back to us and say, well, we would never do anything unnecessary yeah so, you know like you we've got them like okay we've got to adapt we're like constantly adapting and trying to find ways to um actually uh be the most impactful and it does mean that like yeah sometimes we say things and, and they're not as reflective as we'd hope so um cool do you see that you've got the darling statement and then yeah i think just just still reach out and um we'll get to you when we can <laughs> Kia ora, yeah. Um, heading towards, I guess, wrapping up. So I guess the last question for me is just, um, how can people connect more with this kaupapa? What do you think they should read or who should they talk to? We'll share the Darlington Statement and any of those other links um, on our website. So yeah, any suggestions of what, what people should read or who, who they should go to? Feel free to say yourself. <laughs> I was going to say Ursula Le Guin. <laughs> yeah, Octavia Butler, though. Also, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, trigger warning. Um, uh, don't read Middlesex. If you do, read it with a very critical eye. Um, mm. Yeah, it's that hard thing when you've got like cis um, white men writing about other people's experiences without community consultation um I think yeah young people there's lots of amazing young people out there like getting online making videos um centering yeah. experience um I really we're working on resources at the moment but as a massively under funded um time poor organization it's taking a little bit longer so in the interim I'd say this is really beautiful resources by Interact that are real simple but they've got that young person voice centered where it's like titles such as what I wish my parents knew, what I wish my doctors knew. Um, and, you know, it's none of them are really, um, you know, they're all really that like sort of bodily autonomy um, reflection of like, don't talk about us without us. Um, so yeah, I, I really recommend the Interact website. They're an American based um, youth organization that does like policy and advocacy for intersex people. Awesome, thank you. And um, Joey, how about from a trans health perspective, you mentioned PAFA is a good website. What else should people have a look at? I don't entirely feel like I'm gonna manage to list all the things, but I will mm. make sure they go up on the website. Um, one of the, I've, I did a, a volunteer intake training thing recently, it was for Outline actually, and it was like, Afterwards, I did get an email from someone saying, I really liked what you were talking about with the um, trans health and all that kind of stuff. Like, can you can you tell me what books to read or what articles to read? And I realized that I don't have a sense of like 
oh, this book or that book so much. Like it's not, it's, it feels like we're at a point where it's like discursive processes are happening. So like, yeah, following young people on social media or looking at websites for organizations because websites are easily updated or following Instagram posts or whatever. I think that's more likely to give current input, current takes on things. So like, um, yeah, and, and you know, Patha will have a symposium later in the year. And so there are some in-person opportunities if you're in Ototahi in Christchurch, um, September now, I can't remember the date off the top of my head, but the Patha website has those details there are opportunities to learn more about this stuff um, in person and, and social media and in person are the more cutting edge ways of doing it rather than trying to find a, a, a book necessarily or a resource because I think a lot of those um, do go out of date or in mm -hmm. some ways I think the, the need for a local based conversation something that's from here and of here uh, means that I don't like recommending a lot of things that are from other places um, which might still have useful information in them but none of them would represent the conversations that I feel like I get to have with people here so anyway I'm I'm sure yeah. there'll be some cool stuff to put in the in the on the website to point people to and and that's maybe something to say as well is like if you if you can um, get a bunch of people together and like ask your organization or the budgeting team to just make sure you put in some money for um, for groups like ours to come and have a chat um, if it's really relevant and you're at a point where yeah you're thinking about creating policy specifically around these groups like definitely having multiple conversations that a resource would be really awesome to make it mm. more possible yeah mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you both so much for your time and thoughts and wisdom. Um, as you were saying in your corridor, this is these are quite rare spaces to be able to have these conversations um, across these issues and um, think about things in this amount of depth. We're often we're talking to mainstream sectors that is often at that kind of um, more basic kind of definitions, concepts, one hundred and one kind of level. So. It was really awesome to hear from you both today. And um, as I was saying earlier, apologies for the mix up with the slides. Um, this is the second out of a series of um, free webinars for anybody who's working with young people at whatever level um, across Aotearoa. And our next session is next Wednesday at 11 o'clock. It is with um, John Othello, who is from Tinakakahukara as well. And that's around working with Aotearoa's Rainbow Pacifica communities. So hop on our website, register for that one if you haven't already, and keep an eye on our website or our social media to learn about other sessions in this series. As um, Joey was mentioning earlier, we're hoping to have one specifically around disability and rainbow kaupapa at some stage um, as part of this series as well. So yeah, I'll just wrap us up with a quick karakia. Thank you all for being here today. Unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapunui, ki a wātia, ki a māma, ti ngā kau, te tinana, te wairo i te aratakata. Koia rā e rongo, whakaere ake ki ronga, ki a tina, tina, huie, takie. Kia ora, thanks everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Jelly. Thanks to all of our attendees.